Howdy, howdy, this is Mr. Potter. In our last video, we talked about how strings and char arrays are functionally the same thing in C++. I didn't have the ability to access the elements in my char array when I was dealing with them in Java or when I was dealing with them in C Sharp, primarily because of the private state of those instance variables. But I can directly access them in C++ because of the direct access to memory that C++ provides us. What I want to do in today's video is I want to talk about how that arrays for other primitive types work in C++, how I can directly access that memory, and that actually gives us two ways to access an array. One are traditional accessing using the index, and another using this idea of pointers and dereference pointers to access the elements in the array. So I'm going to create a new file here. I'm going to call it arrays.cpp. And I'm going to put in the standard fare, so include iostream. And I'm going to, using namespace standard, put an int main here and put a return zero here. Now, when we were dealing with our other C type languages before, C sharp and Java, the way that we declared an array was very precise. I would have the type. I would have to have the brackets indicating that it is an array. I would have the name of my array. I would say this gets a new memory allocation of type integer. And inside this bracket, I would have the size. Now, C++ does not like this notation. This notation actually means something very different in C++. If I want to declare an int array in C++, I need to have the type. I need to have the name of my variable, and then immediately following it in brackets, I'm going to put the size. That's it. That's how we declare an int array in C++. I have the type, I have the name, and I have the size. So it's much simpler. So I don't have to worry about this idea of allocating new memory in order to do this. This takes care of the memory for me. And what's interesting to note is that when I do this, I'm actually getting five ints out of this. So I can access them in the traditional way. So I'm going to go ahead and create a for loop. I gets zero. I is less than five. I plus plus. And I can say that a sub i is going to get i times i plus i. And then I can do a for loop to access these values. For output, so I can do C out A sub I and a space and then take care of the fence post. And if I was to run this, so G plus plus with arrays.cpp output to arrays.exe, outputting to arrays.exe and then run arrays. Then I see 0, 2, 6, 12, and 20. In other words, standard fare. Right now, aside from initializing my array, aside from starting off and declaring that array variable, everything else is exactly the same with arrays that we dealt with in C++ that we dealt with in, J in Java. So in our previous languages, works exactly the same. What's important for me here is how to access this memory in a different way. So I'm going to declare a second array. So I'm going to say int array, actually I'm going to say int b, and I'm not going to specify the size of the array because I'm going to use an initializer list. So 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29 prime numbers. Okay? Have no idea how many prime numbers I've got here. I could count them if I want to, but I'm lazy. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to see out something called size of b. And what size of will do is it'll tell me, hey, how much memory does this array have? I'm really not paying attention to how many elements are here, but I'm going to go ahead and save. I'm going to recompile, and I'm going to run this, and it's saying, oh, there's 40 bytes. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, 40 bytes for the array. 
And I know that one int takes up four bytes. Well, 40 divided by four means there must be 10 ints here. Well, let's see. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 ints in here. In other words, if I was to take size of B and divide by the size of the first element in that array, save, compile, and run, I find out that I've got 10 elements in this array. Which means I've got this operator here called size of, which tells me how big a particular memory is. So what I can do is I can go ahead and store this instead of printing it out. So I can say int size gets this. And then I can use this variable size to traverse this array. So I'm going to go ahead and say int i gets 0 and say while i is less than size, just go through here and see out b sub i and do a space. And then I need to increment, so i plus plus. And then we're going to take care of our fence post. So if I compile and run this program, it's going to print the contents of array B, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, and 29. So pretty traditional fare. I'm just using a different way of figuring out this size rather than B. And if I wanted to change B, because, you know, there are more primes, save and run, the size of takes care of this for me. It makes sure that all the elements of that array get printed out. I could even pare this down quite a bit. Compile and run, and there we go, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, and 17. So I've got my seven elements that I've got here. But that's not all. I can use size of to figure out how much space is in here, but there's also something else that's interesting. If I was to see out B, what I find out is that B is a memory location. In other words, B is a pointer. And what's even more interesting is what it's pointing at. What I actually find out is that it's pointing to the first element of that array. In other words, when I run it, this memory location and this memory location are exactly the same. The memory location for the array B and the memory location for the first element of that array B0. And furthermore, because this is a pointer, I can dereference it. Remember, we talked about the dereferencing, putting the asterisk in front of it to figure out not what the memory address is, but what is it pointing to. And I find out that it will be the same as the contents of that first cell. So if I compile and run, I find out that, hey, they're both pointing to 2. And that means that along with the idea of plus plusing a pointer advances to the next object in memory, not just the next integer like plus plus does to ints, I should be able to reverse this to traverse this array by directly accessing memory. And so I'm going to do that in our last example here. Uh, I'm going to say an int pointer called C and it's going to be equal to B. In other words, C and B are pointing to the exact same spot in memory. And I'm going to do the following. So I'm going to say int i gets 0, and I'm going to do the following. I'm going to C out a dereference C, in other words, what C happens to be pointing to, as well as what B sub i is and then we will end line. I'm going to increment i, but I'm also going to increment c. Now something important to notice is that while I'm incrementing c, c is pointing to successive elements in this array, b is still pointing to the beginning of the array. 
and so that means that I'm directly accessing the start of this array with B, but I'm accessing the point that I'm traversing with C. And I want to do this while I is less than size. Now remember, size is the size of B, but size is also the size of the array C that we're traversing. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to compile this. Oops. I don't need to declare int i gets 0 because i already exists. I just need to assign it. So let's compile it and run it. And notice that I get 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17. C is always pointing to the ith element of B because I'm incrementing i and incrementing C at the same time. So arrays are pointers. And because arrays are pointers, I can either traverse an array using an index variable, or I can traverse an array by incrementing the pointer variable. Either way will work. Now, one thing that we do have to be careful is that in Java and in C Sharp, we had an integer out of bounds exception. In other words, there was a point where I could eventually run off the end of my array, and then the computer goes, wait, hold up, time out. You can't do that. I can do that here. If I go to C out what's in box 197 of B, most languages would give me an issue here. C++ says, you know what? You know what you're doing. You're a master programmer. So if I compile this and run this, I find out that there is a number, 32,767, in B sub 197. Now, I didn't put that number there. As a matter of fact, I'm accessing something that's 190 blocks after the end of my array. I'm accessing memory that I really have no business accessing, and I'm finding whatever garbage happens to be in that particular spot. And again, this is one of the blessings and curses of C++. Because I have the direct access to memory, I had to do some very powerful things here, such as thinking of an array as a pointer, incrementing the pointer to increment to the next element of the array. But I have to be careful and make sure I don't go past the bounds of the array unless I know what I'm doing. Luckily, at the a little bit earlier in this program, we talked about a very specific way to make sure we don't go beyond the size of the array by using the size of command. The size of allows me to determine not only how much memory my array is taking up, but also how much memory one element of that array is taking up. And by using that ratio, I determined what size was and made sure I never overstepped the bounds of the array unless I explicitly did so. So just as C chars and C++ strings are the same thing. I can think of arrays as an analogous data structure. I can think of arrays as just a collection of ints, the same way that I think of a char as just a collection of, I mean, just as I can think of a string as a collection of chars. So it's some interesting things we've got here. And it's the idea of a pointer and the idea of dereferencing a pointer. In other words, finding the memory location and finding out the contents of a specified memory location that allows me to use this power in C++. So, once again, this is Mr. Potter. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.